I would think that the messages for all this, as we go back to why we're talking about this to begin with, should be pretty obvious, shouldn't they? What kind of leadership do I need to have if I'm going to be a godly leader? Whether it's as an elder, whether it's in any, any function of leadership that we might have in the Lord's church, in, in any aspect, what kind of leader should I be? Do I choose the expedient over the scriptural? Do I look at the circumstance of the day and say, look, I, I know that the Bible says this, but, but God didn't anticipate this situation. God didn't anticipate the fact that, that if, we, if we don't, if we don't uh, accommodate this sin or this error or whatever it is, people are going to leave. And we can't do that because the most important thing is that we all stay together. The important thing is that we keep this church in the condition that it is. In Galatians chapter 2, when Paul was talking about the idea of circumcision, if you remember, he had at one point compelled Timothy to be circumcised that he could go into the temple and minister without, stum- without, without a point of stumbling. But in chapter 2, when it talks about the idea that the, the, the teachers were compelling Titus, a Gentile, to be circumcised, he said, we, was, we, did, not with, we did not give in to them, not for an instance, so that the gospel would be, would be confirmed. We're not going to compromise the truth when it is going to, even though it might allow people to be more accepted and more comfortable with things that are being going. We're going to stand for the truth, even when it costs us. Even in areas where it might be easier just to go along, to get along. Do we make decisions based on how it will make us look to others? Romans 14, 12 talks about the idea that we will all stand before the, the, the judgment of God. You know, we're accountable for ourselves. I'm not, we're not accountable for how this church or that church or this church may think about us, whatever we may do. Do we make decisions based on how we'll be viewed in the brotherhood? Well, if we do this, well, that's not how anybody else does it. They're going to look at us and think that we're wrong, even if it's the needs of this congregation and it's a scriptural thing to do. Now, on the other hand, what happens if everybody around us starts doing something that's not scriptural? And, and well, we want to be just like Israel. We want to be like everybody else. All these other churches are doing this. Why shouldn't we be doing it? It must be a good thing. How do we make our decisions? Do we make them how, do we, do we look around and say, well, what are people going to think about us if we do this? Is that leadership? That's Saul's leadership. But it's not godly leadership. Is staying in charge our priority over speaking the truth? You know, I, I, I'm beyond blessed. I have full confidence that I can stand up here and preach the gospel in all its truth, and I'm not going to be asked to leave. Now, one day, you know, Lord willing, we're going to grow. And Lord willing, we're going to bring people in, and we're going to fill this congregation. Uh, but you don't grow without having issues. And there's going to come a time, and maybe it will be one day, where that's not going to be the case anymore, where people are going to say, you know what, you can't talk about marriage, divorce, and remarriage in here. You can't say this, and if you do, I'm going to go find somebody that will teach me what I want to hear. How are we going to make those decisions? How does a leader respond? How does an elder respond? How does, a, how does anyone, an evangelist, respond to the threat that if you, if, if you continue to teach this, if you keep, um, you're not going to have your authority anymore. You know, we're not going to have an elder over this congregation that believes this or teaches that. What does the strong leader do? Does he put his own authority in, uh, above all else? Or does he teach the truth? You know, John chapter 6, we all remember the story of Jesus uh, he had just fed the 5,000. And in chapter 6, he's gone into the synagogue, and the, the people that he fed are following him along. And they've asked, asked where he is, and he says, you, you, you're not seeking me because, I, because of the, the signs. You're seeking me because you, you, had, you, you ate the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the bread that perishes. And it goes into this long discussion. Over there, in fact, if you want to look over at John chapter 6, um, you know, I think sometimes... We assume in John 6, and this is a lesson in and of itself, we assume that these people didn't know what Jesus was talking about when he said, he that eats my flesh and drinks my blood. And certainly there was some confusion on this. But I, I would suggest to you that there was a, an implication that Jesus is making that they understood very clearly. And that is that you, you know, in John, uh, let's look at 58, um, 58 through 62. Um, he says, this is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught it at Capernaum. And when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. You can listen to it. But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Wait a second, Jesus. You're telling me 
Moses gave us bread. Moses fed us in the wilderness. You're telling me that that was inadequate? And you're telling me that you can give me something better than what Moses gave and that I should turn away from the law and all that heritage and everything and I should put my trust not in the law but in you? What are you going to do for us? He says, does that trouble you? Well, what if you see me ascending back into heaven? What if you see me for who I truly am? Not a prophet, not a servant, not a teacher, the son of God. What are you going to say then? And people didn't follow him after that. People left because he told them the truth. He didn't worry about losing people because he said what needed to be said. And that is leadership from a biblical standpoint. Are our decisions that we make, do we root them in faith? The idea that God works in us when we submit to his will. That's Philippians 2, 12 through 13. We all know verse 12, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We don't always read verse 13 because it says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God is, do we believe that? If I'm willing to submit my will to God and do God's work in God's way, according to God's plan, that that means that God is working in me and that I will not fail. Even though everything around, everybody around us says we will, even though every sign and indication says that it's not going to work, if I'm willing to do what God wants me to do, because my decision is going to be rooted not in my own thoughts and my own capabilities as Saul was, but rather in a faith that God will make his will done. If I am willing to be an instrument for God's work in this life. So who do we serve when we lead, the, lead in the Lord's church? You know, Paul uh, excuse me, I keep saying Paul instead of Saul. That's, an old, that's a weird habit there. But um, When Samuel first talked to Saul about this, he said, you are to be given a pr- as a prince over God's heritage. This isn't about you. This is about God's heritage. This is about what is best for God's people. And at the end of the day, it's, it's easy for us when we look at the kings and thinking about David and all these great men and even the bad ones, we think about the kingship and the seed line and all of these things that are going to happen as a result of that and we lose sight of the fact that God is working for the good of his people and that everything has been done. Whenever a king is brought up, it is for the purpose of serving the people and protecting them. We're gonna, um, uh, you know, Jesus called himself the good shepherd the one who lays down his life for his for the sheep. That's what a leader does. He remembers who he's serving. He remembers who it is that's under him and why it is that he's been given the charge he's been given. So the lesson is yours. Uh, and it leads to a, a, pretty, a, a pretty easy trans, transition into our invitation, which is the question, are we living as God's heritage? You know, when Samuel admonishes the people... Uh, in verses 19 through 21 in chapter 12, he says, Pray for your servant to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. kind of reminds me of what Peter tells the, the Jews in Acts chapter 3. He says, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his, his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that time of refreshment may come from the presence of the Lord. Are we like Saul? Do we feel like we've just gone too far? We're just too ingrained in our sin, too ingrained in the way, in the way we live that we just can't go back anymore? Peter says there's always time to repent. There's always time to come back. If you have something that's in your life that needs to be changed and you need the prayers of the saints, you have that opportunity to do that today to help us to pray for you, to encourage you, whatever it may be, so that you don't have to live that life of rebellion. You can get back in the grace of God. And if you're here this morning and haven't obeyed the gospel yet and you feel like it's the time and you understand what it is to give your life to Christ, we have that opportunity now again. Whatever your need may be, we ask you to come now. It's together we're led as we stand in song.